Good morning. Today's topic is the unshakable kingdom. The unshakable kingdom. The reading is taken from Hebrews 12, verse 18 to the end. Hebrews 12, verse 18 to the end. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers back that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the immutable, innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling, sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yes, once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's begin then ask ourselves, what is or what are the aspirations of Christians? What are the aspirations of Christians? Why do people want to become Christians? What are the benefits? Over my years of ministry, I've asked and I've realized some became Christian because they're scared to go to hell. Some wanted to go to heaven. Some became Christian because of marriage. Some because he said he was born in a Christian home. Some because they wanted the church to help. There are so many reasons. Of course, there are people who really want to believe in Jesus. What, what is heaven like? Why is heaven so attractive to people? People thought that heaven is a serene place, beautiful place, a bright, holy place, no tears, no sickness, long life, etc., etc. Then who wants to go to heaven? People who really want to go to heaven, they say they may be different type of heaven, but they would like to go to heaven. Why? They think it's a beautiful place, it's a good place to be, a place that they will really enjoy. And how do they go? Each, every type of people have different reasons of how they go to heaven. When do they go? Oh, when they die. So I did ask one question, you know, you know, do, how many of you really want to go to heaven? A lot of hands go up, really want to go to heaven. How many want to go to heaven now? No hands go up. Why? No hands go up? Because they still like the earth. You know, they still have a lot of things on the earth that we have not finished. We want. So, we, in the Sunday school, there's a song that has been sung for many times. He said, heaven is a happy place, happy place, happy place. Heaven is a happy place. What else? My fair lady. Or, he said, oh, uh, 
I want to be there, whatever the answer is. So because of that, people thought it's heaven is a happy place. So Christians want to go to heaven and want to be, you know, to, to be in a place that is happy, it's good. But let us look at the scripture's view of the heaven, of the kingdom of heaven, the Bible uses it. Today's lesson in Hebrews 12 tells us the verse 18 to 24. He says, it is a very holy place. Heaven is a, a very holy place. Not a place that come not you not not come to a place of blazing fire, darkness, gloom, and tempest. No, no, no. This is exactly what the author to the Hebrew says. No, no, this is a wrong concept. They thought it's a blazing fire, darkness, gloom, and tempest. Not a place with the sound of the trumpet and the voice whose word made the hearers beg that no further messages to be spoken. You know, like in the olden days, they say, oh, enough, enough, don't speak anymore. That's not heaven. Not one frightening place that the order given, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. So we, when we look at all these things, we say, hey, heaven is an awful place, you know, better don't go. Not a place that the sight is so terrifying, even Moses said, I tremble with fear. But the author says, verse 22, You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in Festus gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a covenant. That's what the author of the Hebrews began to remind his readers, saying that, hey, this the wrong concept. Heaven is not the concept of the past, the wrong concept, but it is heaven is a beautiful place, a gathering place, a celebration place, a place that so perfect and so beautiful. That's a scripture view. The other question is, how do we gain access to heaven? How do we gain access? So verse 25 tells us that, see that you do not refuse him. Do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. The question is, have we refused God? Now, refuse to what state? We will come back again. Then he says, how to gain access to heaven? First, don't refuse him, accept him, believe him. Then secondly, we must offer God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Now, these two links together. So, the first one is, do not refuse him. Okay? Not, you refuse him means, this is my way, I go this way, this is his way. So, you don't use his way. No. Don't refuse me means, go with him in his way. The scripture tells us very much, very clearly, you know, very clearly the scripture tells us that, he says, first, the, in the gospel, Jesus says, come and follow me. Come and follow me. Mark 1 verse 17 says, come and follow me. So that is an invitation. Don't refuse him. Come and follow him. And secondly, in the Acts of the Apostles, Apostle Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Repent. You come, but then come, when you come, you repent of your sins and baptize in His name. There are people who want to follow Jesus, but don't want to repent. They want people who want to follow Jesus. They want to come to Jesus, but don't want to be baptized. Don't want to be identified with Him. In the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostle says, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and the household. Do you really believe? Believe Him. And in Romans, Paul says, 
If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if you by the Spirit, you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeed of the body, you will live. So there are few things that here he keeps telling us, you know, don't refuse him. First, his invitation, come. Don't refuse him. Come, you repent of your sins and identify yourself with Jesus. Baptize. Then he says, Believe him fully. There are people who come have not repent. And so people who come and repent have not believed. And the people who come and repent and believe, but then you must live according to the Spirit. So that's when you do that, ah, that's the invitation. Don't refuse him. Don't refuse him. Now, because now we begin to stop and ask ourselves, have we done all these things ourselves? Have we truly come to Jesus? Willingly follow Him? Have we really repent of our sins and be identified with Him? Have we really believe in Jesus? You and your household will be saved. Have we lived according to the Spirit or live according to our ways. Come is easy. So a lot of people come. Repent may be harder, but still can be done. You know, to identify, to get baptized. But sometimes people have after baptized, you can see their life. No change. They say, believe in Jesus. Do you really believe? And you shall be saved. Do you really believe? Where is Jesus? Some people say, say this is Bishop Muni. You know, Muni is Muni. Bishop, you add a bishop, he's Bishop Muni. You add an archbishop, he's Archbishop Muni. You add whatever name he has, he, that is him. But if you put Jesus into him, that's a different person. That means you believe and Jesus in you. Not only come, you repent, you believe, and now Jesus is in me. That's the different person. That you call Christian. That you call a child of God. That you call a disciple of God. And you live according to Him. That's when Jesus is in you. Then we don't need to go on to offer ourselves to God. Because we have, to, we have received the kingdom that cannot be shaken. So we must offer ourselves to God. And how do we also offer ourselves to God? So it says, to offer ourselves to God. In the epistles, Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Just now I say, now you put Jesus in me, then I'm a different person. So now you examine yourself. Is Jesus still there? And when Jesus is still there, then he said, you go to the next stage. I have been crucified with Christ. No, I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. So, you begin to walk that life, to deny so many things. Allow God to hold your life and crucify yourself with Christ. No longer live the things that is past. Then he says, it is by grace you have been saved to faith, and it's not from ourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. So all the strength you examine yourself, you crucify yourself in Christ, that is the grace of God who come with you, who were given to you, and it is that grace that pour upon you, that make you so strong and special. Do not be anxious about anything, but by everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. So he said, don't worry about other things. The grace of God is with you. We examine you crucify. You don't feel that, oh, I lose this thing, I lose that thing, I don't have this, I don't have that. No. Just don't be anxious. Pray. And God be thanksgiving. You believe God, God will lead you on. And set your minds on things that are above, not on things on the earth. So when this when you have these things, you know, he says. You must come, you must repent, you must 
believe and you must live in Him, then now daily we examine our lives, daily we crucify ourselves with Christ, and then daily we receive the grace of God, you know, telling ourselves it is not my work, not my job, but it's God's grace who given me, who put me in this place, in that place, it's God's grace. And then do not fear any anxious, just pray and make the petition known to God, the thanksgiving, and keep setting our minds on things above. When we do those things, when we know that when we all have all when we have done all these things, then we will know that God is with us. So I was like, this is called the unshakable kingdom. Then you have already entered into the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. I keep reminding Paul and the scripture keep reminding us, he says, do not forsake your first love. Have you forsaken your first love? Sometimes we walk and walk and we forgot. Do not be lukewarm. Don't be neither here nor there. Jesus says, I'm standing at your door and knock. I'm standing at the door and knock. Will you open the door? So he repeats saying to him, I ought knock at the door. Will you come and open the door? Will you repent of your sins? Identify with me. Will you believe me? Will you live according to the Spirit? Now, will you examine yourself daily? Will you be willing to be crucified with me? He says, will you receive my grace that is not your work, not your power, not your strength, but me, my grace? Will you pray, do not be anxious? And will you set your minds daily on things that are above? That's called the investment, the eternal investment. You are investing eternally in God. You are investing all that in God. First, you come and enter into that unshakable kingdom. And then you go further and further and further. And that is the investment. The investment is keep examining yourself. Investment keep setting your mind on things about. Investment is keep giving thanks to God and pray. And investment is to receive God's grace. It is not your strength, but it is Him who help you. That is investment. Investment eternally. And God bless you. So you will do that. If you have not received Jesus Christ, today you can receive. Just come to Jesus. He's knocking at the door. If you have received, He says, don't forget your first love. And don't be lukewarm. Because you walking halfway, you stop. You may not progress. Your investment has stopped. Once your investment stops, you are digress, de regressing. You're backsliding. Need to move on, my dear friends. Receive Jesus. Believe Him. And pray. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks to You. We want to believe You. Come, Lord Jesus, into our life. I will come to You and I'll repent of my sins and I'll believe You and willing to live according to the Spirit. Help me to continue daily to examine my lives, you know, daily to set my mind on things above, you know, daily to willingly crucify with Christ, daily to receive Your grace. And it's not my works and I don't boast. To daily to pray and petition with thanksgiving and ask the Lord daily to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.